Hi, it's Jake here. Welcome to the Voluntary Life. I'm very, very pleased to have a special guest. It's Jeffrey Tucker, author of It's a Jetson's World. Thanks so much for coming on, Jeffrey. Really, it's great to be here. Right now, I'm in San Diego. I've just finished up four days at the Oxford Club's Investment University. I've learned so much over the last four days. Um, and it fits very much into the things I've been writing about. So anyway, awesome. it's very good to be here. Awesome. Yes, I was down there for the um, Libertopia conference mm -hmm. um, last year. Um, so yeah, nice town. Um, well, thanks so much for coming on. As I say, I, I thought it might be interesting to, um, to start off. Um, with just a little bit about your background. I, I okay. really, really enjoy um, your writing and, and this book. And you have written um, a bit about your background um, in terms of your sort of intellectual influences. I know that you um, were obviously um, very close to Murray Rothbard and, and, and Rand and so forth. And you mentioned also that you have, in the book, you talk about the fact that you had quite a lot of experience working in different places and sort of getting mm. experience at the marketplace. But I guess my question, just to start, is, you know, going way back, did you did you grow up surrounded by sort of libertarian ideas, or or how did you even get interested in you know the sort of just basic ideas of, of I guess freedom and, and liberty and so forth? My first political memories, incredibly, uh, date back to Watergate, actually. And I remember being in public school, and in those days we had this weekly newspaper that was delivered to us, and I, I think it was called something like The Weekly Reader. And it was a classic sort of catechism of the civic religion, you know. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, uh, so it was in, like, third or fourth grade. And um, I quickly realized that everything in there must be false because uh, it, it was very heavy heavy-handed sort of um, official newspaper of, of, of the public school genre. So it would tell you what to think about politics. And, and I, the, the dominant line I remember from those days is that, uh, that Richard Nixon is a uniquely wicked individual who's disgraced the presidency as no person had, had ever had. But fortunately, he's being pursued by angels and the other party and if right. all goes well, we'll purge this uh, this uh, snake from our garden. You know, <laughs> right. I, remember, I remember thinking, you know, uh, surely the story's got to be slightly more complex than that. So I wasn't much a believer in the orthodox, even from those early age. I think this might be due to my own parents, who tended to be um, kind of conservative Republicans. Now, I held on to a kind of a Cold War orthodoxy, in that old-time Republican sense, all the way through, I think, uh, when I was a junior in college. And then the whole Reagan thing became very obviously a fraud to me. And the first time I began to recognize that the parties, the political parties, um, were not telling you the truth, you know, that you were sort of being browbeat to believe things for some ulterior motive. Um, I freed myself uh, from that that what I would call the vending machine approach to politics, you know, where you press a sort of button and then out comes the thing that you're supposed to eat, you know. Mm. And, uh, and that was a great liberating moment because I thought, oh, hell, I can believe whatever I want to believe based on whatever principles I want to adopt. And gradually over time, um, you know, I've worked my, my way to a kind of a consistent, uh, what I guess today is called a Rothbardian anarchist uh, position, which I now regard as a, just a kind of a pure realistic way of understanding the way the world really works um, uh, in, 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 in real life. Yeah, absolutely. I would agree. Well, it's, it's, right. not, it's not an ideology so much as just no. actually seeing things the way they are. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, and I think that maybe perhaps the ideological stage comes first. But, you know, if, you, if, if the so-called ideology that you adopt is, is robust and realistic and consistent, then you should discover within the course of your life uh, that you're surrounded by evidence that uh, seems to reinforce it, you know. Uh, yeah. So it's not something you have to constantly sort of remind yourself of. No, the world itself reminds you of it. Now, uh, the theory is important because without that kind of consistent theoretical apparatus, I don't think that it's possible to sort of authentically see the world as it really is. So I don't want to disparage the importance of, of ideology. At the same time, I don't think ideology should ever be considered a kind of an artificial 
uh, thing that's tacked on to uh, reality or something like that. No, it's a it's a it's a clarifying lens through which to see uh, the way the world truly works. And yeah. gradually over time, um, you know, you begin to reflect on your own life and the life of others. And if you read history constantly, you begin to see that everything beautiful, wonderful, uh, everything that seems to support the flourishing of life itself emerges from the voluntary uh, transactions and tradings of, of commercial life and everything that's associated with that, and that the state has done nothing but make the world a worse place than it otherwise would have been. So that's the message that I just can't stop talking about because yeah. I find it exciting. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, and that, that brings me to one of the unique um, aspects of your book, Something that really struck me about um, It's a Jetson's World is that, you know, there are, there are lots of people writing from a sort of um, Austrian economics, um, libertarian uh, perspective about what's going on at the moment uh, in the American economy, in the world economy, and about all of the sort of increasing encroachments on, on liberty that are taking place. And, you know, you, you write about that in this book, but I think what's really unique is that you're also writing from a, a sort of uh, Austrian economics perspective on the other side of what's happening, which is, you know, the amazing way in mm. which um, entrepreneurship is changing um, culture and changing the way that we live. And, yeah, you know, I think it's really interesting that because, I guess, if you come from an, a, a, an approach like, the the Austrian school where you you're very aware of the terrible dead weight of the state and the problems that it causes you can I think get sort of a bit trapped in in a sort of doom and gloom mentality and what I find interesting is that you know you have written about that but you're also writing about the really positive things that the market is still doing despite you know, everything else that's going on with, with the, the growth of the state. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it, one of the marvelous f fi things I find about entrepreneurship is how it's always able to sort of find the workaround to whatever barriers that exist, and including even the, uh, the barriers that the state has erected. And, and you're right, we're living in a uniquely uh, innovative time, and we're surrounded by astonishing miracles that are changing every day. I mean, you if uh, if you just sort of sort of drop out for a week or so and arrive back again, you'll find that, uh, everything just just different enough and and improved enough in the in the digital world, in particular. Um, it's it's a very exciting time to be alive. I mean, we are very fortunate to be living in a kind of social, cultural, economic transition that makes the Industrial Revolution look like nothing by comparison. And the, the amazing irony is that it's happened exactly at the same time that you know Leviathan, at least in the developed world, is on the march as, as far as we can tell, it's never been before. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't think this is, this is, you know, it's, it's hard really to, to process reality, uh, this reality. I mean, we've got a, a kind of state ruling over the physical world in this grueling, oppressive way, uh, systematically destroying things. Um, uh, and I, I write a lot about this, the destruction of the state. But at the same time, it was very interesting to me that in the year 1995, I think that's when we can really date the beginnings of the sort of uh, revolutionary moment um, in the digital world, that, that, that this brand new opportunity came along for the expression of human creativity and for the dynamism of the commercial marketplace to sort of take hold of the world as it's never happened before. And, and this came about you know, some five years after the end of the Cold War, where, you know, half the world's population suddenly found itself liberated uh, from the chains of, of slavery. So all these forces sort of came together, um, and now we're seeing uh, the magic of the, of the marketplace sort of take, take technology and humanity to new heights, despite you know, the relentless attacks by the state, despite every attempt to drag us back into a state of nature, which is really essentially what the state's all about. And I think it's a tremendous credit to liberty that this has been able to be accomplished. 
Right. And I, I guess that brings me to a question which, um, which I sometimes sort of struggle with in, in terms of holding these two different perspectives in my head at the same time mm. of the, the, all the amazing technological change and progress that's happening at the same time as the growth of the state. And I, I wonder, you know, what you, you think about this, which is just the question of, is the world getting better or are we <laughs> going downhill really, really quickly? Uh, one, sometimes I, I look at the encroachments on civil liberties and, and what's happening politically. And I think there's no way that um, the sort of fiat currency game can carry on um, without disastrous consequences uh, in the very near future. And then another day, I, I have a, a, a much more optimistic outlook, which is that, you know, despite all of this, we're, we're living in this fantastic time of progress. Mm -hmm. and so I guess just as, a, as an open question, you, do you think that things are getting better or things are getting worse? Well, um, I, I think that the most notable thing about reality has always been that we only really know for sure what's going on now. And we have some vague sense of what happened in the past, you know, all the data that we've accumulated. But the one thing that unites all of humanity is nobody knows for sure what's uh, coming tomorrow. And to me, that is very exciting. So within this world of uncertainty, um, we have the possibility of kind of reinventing you know, uh, you know, everything day by day. And so long as there's a, uh, a, some room for human volition and creativity to express itself, I think we have every reason to be extremely optimistic, you know, despite, um, uh, despite the attacks on human liberty that are going on all the time. You mentioned money. Now, that is an intriguing thing because um, if the money dies so much of the virtual world, you know, could come under threat, mm. too. And so that's a, a very disturbing element and uh, uh, th that upset. So there's several, th several things going on that, I, f that I, I find to be very dark signs. One is um, unemployment among the young. I'm, I'm very troubled by the cultural effects of that. And th the other one is the institution of, of money and what the, what the federal, federal government, what the Federal Reserve is doing to that. Mm. Um, on the other hand, um, you know, are there, op are there ways in which the digital world can even sort of liberate us from those institutions? Um, I think we're going to find that out in the, in the near future. In any case, I don't, you know, I, 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 despair is a bad idea in all times and all places. And it just does nothing. I mean, what is the point of living of a life uh, of despair? I, and I won't do it, and I can't, I can't do it. And, and nobody who's ever changed the world has ever done it. You know, we have to be hopeful. And uh, I think hope is the beginning of a beautiful future. And so I, I mean, you could say, well, that sounds like a dogma without evidence. Well, maybe it is. But, you know, we have very limited days on this earth, and I believe in the capacity of ideas to affect the future. And um, and we're here for a reason, and I want to make a difference. And I think every libertarian should want to make a difference, too. And that requires some degree of hope and, and optimism and a desire to make change. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a, a fantastic outlook, and indeed um, a very entrepreneurial one, because that's sort of the approach that you have to take if you if you actually want to make make anything happen in your own life. If you want mm -hmm. to, if you want to affect change, um, start start something new, make a business, and so forth. You you have to um, go at it with a, um, a really positive and uh, constructive outlook, and with living with that uncertainty that you talk about, because otherwise you'd never get anything done. And, and you know, one of the really strong reasons to be to be uh, wildly optimistic now, I think, is generally underestimated by virtually everybody, and that is uh, the uh, global communication revolution that's taken place. You know, um, people have always underestimated the extent to which the the sheer capacity for people to have conversations with each other is uh, uh, amounts to productive capital in the world mm -hmm. i mean between the beginning of recorded history and about 1830 there was no possibility whatsoever for geographically non-contiguous conversations to take place anywhere on the planet if you wanted to get a message to somebody you had to run to them sail to them ride a horse 
uh, put a, a, a note in a, in a, in a bottle, uh, <laughs> you know, right. send it by carrier pigeon, uh, send smoke signals, whatever it's going to be. But suddenly in 1830, we saw for the very first time the invention of the telegraph, which was something like a miracle. Uh, it's with a series of dots and dashes. You could you could send little limited messages, and and I don't think that it is coincidence that the 19th century saw the greatest economic growth. I mean, it was really the break, the hinge of history. You know, that was the break, great break in in the history of humanity, where we really saw the dramatic expansions of. Uh, of uh, lifespans, of the creation of the middle class, of rising incomes, the end of infant mortality, uh, the el- elimination of so many diseases, the uh, invention of the railroad and and uh, steel, and and then you know in the later part of the century, after a brief interruption of these ghastly wars, uh, we saw economies growing five and ten percent. You know, this was all inaugurated initially by a communications revolution. So. That's what the telegraph was able to do. And it eventually led to the telephone and all these wonderful things. So look what's happened since 1995. The fact that this conversation we're having right now, yeah. uh, well, I'm, I'm in a San Diego hotel and, you, you, and everybody else in the conversation is all over the world, is, is a remarkable uh, thing. And to imagine that this can take place potentially among 7 billion people, that means we all are in a position to learn from each other, mm. which is... Part of it's the great force of free enterprise. You know, we, we talk about, about competition, we talk about trade, but learning from each other, emulation, and uh, copying each other's ideas, and observing each other's successes, and replicating them, and improving on them, this is the great energy that builds civilization and builds prosperity. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I, I think one of the things that I... I'm really, um, I find really wonderful and amazing is just um, this this process that's going on whereby the amount of information that we um, on the planet are generating is growing exponentially. And you can measure this through, you know, the growth of the internet and, 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 and lots of other ways. And as you say, you know, when you, when you connect more people together, um, the possibilities of those connections grow exponentially too, because you have that network effect of more people being able to talk to, be, having, having more opportunities to more to, to communicate with more different people. And I think it sort of it reminds me of that um, argument uh, by uh, I think it's Julian Simon, the the ultimate um, resource, um, the idea that you know what really constrains us is ultimately our own innovation because. When we come across natural uh, resource constraints, then we find ways to work around them because that's what people do. That's the amazing thing that people that people are able to do. So the real constraint on us is our ability to generate new ideas and, and innovate. And given that we have this amazing technology, which is allowing more and more people to communicate, that's unleashing you know a really amazing potential, which you know who who knows um how you know where that's going to be taking us in in the future no that's right and i don't know if you, i i like to make the analogy of um most people hate meetings when you have when you have meetings in offices you know uh do you know what i mean when you've ever worked in an office where let's all meet yeah. you know for and and so um, you can have two kinds of meetings, those that, where everybody shows up a des- with the desire to kind of push their point of view, and then uh, the strongest person survives, and you walk out with really nothing having been done except for a decision was made about who's going to be in charge. That's an unproductive meeting. Mm-hmm. The other kind of meeting is that where everybody shares their ideas, and people learn from each other, and the result is something, some idea that no one in the room imagined when they entered the room. So we all leave smarter and better than we, we entered that room. So I like to think of the Internet as a kind of a global productive meeting in that sense. Everybody's approaching it as a learner, you know, under the best cost possible situation. And you're changed as a result of what of the information you extract from other people. And through this sort of gradual improvement, which is going on 24-7, you know, among billions of people, um, ideas are able to just fly around the world in, in, in an instant. And we should never forget that the future we're going to observe tomorrow in the world is nothing other than the result of the ideas that we are holding in our heads today. They all, everything begins. All reality begins um, in the world of ideas. 
Mm. Yeah, it's, um, uh, I think um, a book I was reading recently about a completely different subject, but made a really interesting point that um, we, this world that we live in is an entirely imagined world in, in the sense that this building that I'm, I'm currently in right. was imagined by someone and it was that's made right. reality. And that's a really exciting thought that, you know, yeah, as you say, everything that's going to come in the future is, is, is going to be um, imagined by the people who, who are here now. Yeah, that is exactly right. And none of us are able to do this on our own. And I think this is a very important point. And you, you get a little bit of this when you read, when you read um, uh, Mises, you know, um, and Hayek, I think, to even a, to a lesser extent. But mainly Mises, I think, is, is the guy who really saw this, that uh, alone... There's not. We don't have a whole lot uh, to contribute to the world, except for um, our capacity to extract information from others and put it together in new ways. And then we become um, we become amazing, you know. But but in isolation, we can't really come up with much. I remember when I was a, when I was a kid. Uh, maybe every I don't know. Does everybody have this nightmare? I, I used to have this nightmare that I was suddenly transported to a very primitive tribe, right. where where uh, there was no technology at all and there was no music and there was no real dance and there was certainly no electricity and um, people were living in huts and caves and uh, uh, that, that was about the whole of it, you know. And so I'm kind of put in a position to uh, try to reinvent my world just so I could be comfortable again. Mm. <laughs> and it used to terrify me because I thought, you know, gosh, if I was in a position to make electricity, I don't even think I would... I would know where to begin, you know. So, and this was when I was a little boy. And I, so I would study just absolutely everything under this presumption that, uh, that I could find myself in this kind of uh, situation someday. And I would be called upon to recreate civilization. Right. And, it, and, of course, it's a preposterous idea. I mean, none of us can do it. Nobody on the planet could ever do it. The only reason we live in the world we live in is because we're the benefactors of this uh, uh, of this of this wild sort of group learning that's ongoing, and the fact that we're able to benefit from all the learning that's ever taken place in in in, in the last five hundred, one thousand, two thousand, three thousand years, you know, this is all of the of the capital of that civilization has given this present generation, and it's diffuse, and it's everywhere, and it's cumulative. And we're using it every day, and it's not possible to just recreate this on our own. We all need each other. And that's a very important, I think, li uh, message that libertarianism has to offer. And it's strange to me, and it's interesting to me that you know, we so often hear libertarianism characterized as, as individualism. You know? and, mm -hmm. I, and I like that phrase, because I believe in individual rights. But that's as far as individualism really extends actually, to, to the rights of the individual. In terms of uh, building civilization, we are all super-duper dependent on each other, but it's only a kind of dependency that's productive insofar as human volition is allowed to express itself in the context of human rights. You know, in an anarchist world, in other words, uh, we're going to be more productive than we would be in any other kind of uh, world situation, because... Um, we're then free to learn and free to act on that information that we've, we've learned. So I think libertarianism, I mean, I, you know, another word for libertarianism, if that word weren't already taken, would be socialism, for example. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. I, yeah, that's funny. I understand what you mean, though, because yeah. you know, there is a real humility in understanding what the division of labor means. Mm. And what you're talking about is, you know, the immense sort of human capital that's built up um, and you know all of the the the, um, the capital that we have that, that, that from previous um, uh, generations that's built up. You know there's there is a real humility in understanding that you know the way our civilization works is that we all, as you say, really depend on each other, and that the the um, you know what comes out of that is far more than any sort of. Uh, individual um, would ever um, be able to even imagine, let alone achieve. And so I agree with you that whereas sometimes, you know, the, there is, um, maybe because of Rand, I don't know, but there's a, a view of this kind of uh, isolated, egoistic individualism yeah. in, in, in this outlook. Actually, I think, you know, there's, it, it's really people who understand the free market that 
that are, as you say, most social because we yeah. we understand that we need big cities and we need you know amazing communication networks because we need yes. to connect with everyone else because that's actually how we create this kind of world. Yeah, you, you said a, a lot just then, and that is exactly right. I mean, this is what has driven people out of the countryside into the city, the desire to interact, the desire to learn and cooperate with each other. And that move from, from the country to the city uh, was a major force for what gave rise uh, to the Gilded Age, for example, uh, because then people could share techniques and share knowledge and observe and uh, be challenged in new ways by what other people are doing and improve those things just slightly on the margin. Um, yeah, that, that is a, a, a major uh, factor. And, and imagine, so the move, I mean, the move to the city was what took us out of, for lack of a better term, the Dark Ages, you know. Uh, and it's what led to the Industrial Revolution and it's what led to the Gilded Age. So now, in the digital world, no matter where you happen to live, even the most remote location in the world, however impoverished the society is, if you have a digital connection to the rest of the world, you have, in effect, moved to the city. Now, how beautiful is that? I mean, the whole globe has yeah. become one big cosmopolitan communication network. That is astonishing. And it works itself out in practical ways every single day. Every day. And so, so that you and I, as individuals, we don't have to be massive corporations anymore to outsource, as they used to say. No, we can, as individuals, outsource to anybody on the planet immediately and yeah. benefit from somebody's knowledge no matter where they happen to live. That's, that, that's really what accounts for all the miracles we have around us today. That, that more than anything else. Absolutely. No, I think that's, that's um, a, a wonderful summary of a, a, a really great outlook. I want to... Well, uh, Sorry? You mentioned Rand. Let me just say something about Rand. Because, sure. you know, I, I, people always ask me what my view of, of Rand, and I, I feel like Rand, the way a lot of uh, people feel about, about their siblings, it's like I can criticize them, but, but you can't, you know? So I feel <laughs> like that way, a little bit about Rand, I can criticize her, but, but when, when, when some, some lefty comes along to blast her, you know, I, I want to come to her defense. I, I find I have a lot of affection for her um, personally and her amazing life story. Uh, more than I do her um, her conception of the cap capitalistic marketplace, which I think was fundamentally flawed, really. Yeah. Yeah, I I I would agree with you. And we've um, we've talked about um, um, a lot of her books on on this Freedom Book Club, and um, I I think um, yeah, there are some limitations, but I agree with you. You know, I, I would uh, definitely. Uh, stand stand uh, beside her when it comes to some of the yeah. criticisms that she receives. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I agree with you. I think, I, you know, I actually, I think the biggest problem that she, that she had intellectually was uh, um, her belief that ideas um, can be private property. And yeah. I talk about the subject extensively in uh, the Jetsons world. I really do think it's extremely important that libertarians give up any attachment they have to the idea of intellectual property. Yeah, I actually wanted to ask you about that because I, I, you know, as you say, um, it's quite a big part of um, of your book, um, Jetson's World. Is you sort of, in a way, what you do is go through your own intellectual journey to, yes. to the, you know, the the, the realization that you've had about um, intellectual property, and right. and I think it fits very very closely with what we've been talking about because mm -hmm. if um, you know if the real um, the real dynamism that we have um, in our civilization, in, to the extent that we have it, comes from innovation and from people exchanging ideas and so forth, then intellectual property is also very much um, a, a, something that slows that process and, you know, and, and stops it, actually hinders it significantly. Mm -hmm. and, and you mm -hmm. give a lot of examples in, mm -hmm. um, in the book about... Um, both, you know, why the, why the idea itself is is um, is just not tenable, but also right. how badly it, it impacts on innovation. It does exactly the opposite to what it's advertised to do. Mm -hmm. And you know, yeah. sorry, no, sorry, go yeah, ahead. I, I was talking to a, an entrepreneur yesterday who's very very much involved in 
uh, technology of local search and its relationship to uh, kind of retail establishments, and he's got a great business model going. And I asked him, I said, well, have you uh, considered patenting some of these ideas? He said, oh, I would never, I would never patent. I would, I would never use a patent. I said, well, is that on moral grounds? He goes, no, I, not really on moral grounds. It's, it's purely practical. You know, once you patent something, an entrepreneur is somehow wedded to that idea. You get um, irrationally tied to a particular process or a particular um, uh, code, uh, a particular way of doing things. Mm. And he said, that's terrible. In this world, you have to be prepared to throw out every day whatever it is you did yesterday um, or else you're going to fall behind. So he said intellectual property is the worst thing an entrepreneur uh, can do because... You 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 actually give up your flexibility, and you you get you get sort of tied to a static model of doing things. And you wake up one day and you find out you're dead, and, and then you're angry about it. So all you can do is sue people. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so, yeah. So I I was really intrigued by that because that's an argument I hadn't actually heard before. Uh, so I was really pleased to hear that point of view from a man who's you know every day got. Uh, you know, tens of millions of, of, of dollars invested, uh, and it's got to stay in the black. And he said the the patents would be the worst worst thing for him personally. Mm. Very interesting, isn't it? Yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, the funny thing is that um, when I uh, I I, um, I started a business and, and sold it, grew it and sold it, um, and back in two thousand uh, when I started the business, um, we did develop software, and so we had um, some so called intellectual property. And I, it, just as it happens, um, I, I knew a very, very uh, distinguished um, uh, IP lawyer who was um, by no means libertarian, but really knew the IP field very, very well. And at the time, I, I didn't know any of these ideas. And I just uh, assumed, oh, I suppose we ought to get some kind of IP protection. And interestingly enough, um, even though this that was this guy's field his advice to me on purely practical grounds was don't even go there don't even think about patenting it first of all because if you do patent it what you will do is just spend all of this money and all of this time outlining exactly what it is that your um, that your algorithm does and how it works and firstly anyone who's really worth their salt that will just help because They'll take that and they'll find a way to reverse engineer around that and achieve the same thing. So at the end of the day, you might as well just keep your software to yourself if, you right. know, if that's your advantage and get on with the business. Yeah, And, yeah, and that's right. what we did. Um, and you know, this was at the time not on, on any principled ground, but just because you know, getting involved, enmeshed in that sort of terrible legal swamp that you get into when you try and go for protection like that was uh, was just not worth it for a, a small startup. Yeah, it's, that's a very interesting perspective, and I mean, I've certainly uh, I, can, I can I can totally see it and I can completely understand it. Um, you know, and I wonder too, you know, uh, about even the world of software. So much code now has been has been patented. Uh, I, I'm 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 glad I'm not a young code writer trying to start some new software system because. Uh, you know, it's just a minefield out yeah, there, I and think it's, it's really tragic. Absolutely. I think, funnily enough, in, in the sort of 12 years since, since I was given that advice, what's changed is that there are so many defensive patterns that now yeah. you, you know, you're sort of walking through a minefield because yeah. you don't, you know, you're not even necessarily looking for protection by, uh, by patenting. You're just looking to try and um, uh, ensure yourself against getting sued by by other people by patent trolls essentially. Yeah, so. yeah, 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 that's it's terribly tragic. And and for every process that exists, I mean, there are probably ten or fifteen patents that could conceivably cover it. So there's there's you know just just an, an, an infinite number of possible suits that could be filed you know at any second. Mm. Uh, and wow, what a what a what a damaging thing that is for the free enterprise process, and and the idea that anybody would call this, you know, the enforcement of property rights is is just uh, crazy. I did a, a fun little project the other day. It occurred, it just suddenly occurred to me, you know, where did Silly Putty come from, and and how was it marketed? So I just did a quick, quick little bit of research and wrote an article about it. And sure enough, you know, Silly Putty um, 
as with all great things, uh, was invented simultaneously by three different people, you know, back in the late 1940s. Um, it, uh, they imagined wonderful industrial uses for this stuff that never <laughs> were found. <laughs> it turns out it's just kind of a cool, fun thing to play with. Um, and there were three patents uh, filed for it, you know, almost simultaneously, you know. And, uh, and uh, a lot of time was wasted among silly putty creators uh, suing each other. Mm. The stuff ended up being gigantically successful and pretty much the same now as it's always been, um, but uh, mainly because of uh, the marketing genius that was behind it, not because of the, not because of the patents. Yeah. <laughs> it's, I enjoyed it's, that article. Yeah. Uh, I, think, uh, and that, I think that really highlights the fact that the, you know, the, the whole IP system and IP law is propping up this myth of the lone genius, you know, yeah. who sits on their own and comes up with some incredible innovation where, whereas, you know, as we've been talking about, um, and as you've been um, uh, talking about, the way that it actually happens is through people having chance encounters, meeting lots of different people, having it, a network of influences on them, and then these ideas tend to get generated by multiple people uh, uh, around the same time because it's it that's what everyone is kind of linked into and learning about so um i think actually the whole ip system is partly responsible for people having a, a, a misconception about where innovation really comes from um yeah. and, uh, when as you've and, and you write about this in the book as well when really the truth is that things get invented by a whole bunch of people uh usually around the same time because that's the problems that industries are working on and people are all talking with each other and thinking and so um, ideas tend to emerge incrementally um, with lots of people adding a slightly different slant on it until you get a real interesting innovation. That's right. We're all breathing the same air. I mean, mm. that's really true. There's a very interesting scene in some of the biographies of, of Rand that comes through. You know, she was good friends with uh, Isabel Patterson. Now, here you have Rand, who believed very strongly in intellectual property rights, uh, but and this is about Patterson. I don't know what her view was. Um, uh, if she did believe in IP, it wasn't very dogmatically, but they would have these wonderful sort of evening-long conversations at the end of which they would, uh, you know, emerge more brilliant than they were before. Right. And then the, then the next day, uh, they would talk again and uh, restate some of their ideas, and they would get in arguments with each other about who di whose idea was that. So Rand, <laughs> Rand would say, well, I'm sorry, that was, that was my idea. And Isabel Patterson would say, would say no, that's crazy. I, that, was, that was actually my idea. You remember what I said, you know, such and such? And Rand said, no, well, you may have said that, but you know, I, before that, I said such and such. And they would get in these knockdown, drag-out arguments, and Rand would you know, uh, storm away accusing Isabel of being a thief, you know. <laughs> Yeah. I don't know. What, it wouldn't have been so much easier if they had just said, you know what, we both have valuable things to contribute to each other, and we're both better off but because, because our ideas cross-pollinated. You know, shake hands, you know, toast, toast with a glass of champagne and move on. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> I, you know, Oscar, Oscar Wilde uh, used to say that the trouble with socialism is that it takes too many evenings. So the problem with, uh, with IP, yeah, is it just takes too many evenings. <laughs> 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 Absolutely. Yeah, I think she would have been a lot happier and, and more relaxed if she, yeah. if she wasn't so uh, stuck on, on IP. Yeah. Well, I want to give a chance for, um, uh, I'm really enjoying your, your, um, your, your thoughts and thank you so much again. Um, I want to give a chance for anyone else who, who has any uh, questions or if, if guys, if you would like to uh, ask Jeffrey anything, then, then please do jump in. My, my book is full of outrageous things. Surely somebody has an objection. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Greg. Hey, I've got a question. Um, oh, I, so first of all, Jeffrey, I um, I loved your book, and I particularly liked um, chapter forty on uh, intellectual property. Mm. Um, it was a fairly lengthy chapter compared to a lot of the other ones, and I really enjoyed the um, historical examples you gave. And I'm I something that I've been wrestling with with myself over the or with uh, inside my you know, when I, when I think about this kind of stuff over the past, I don't know, especially a year or two is a lot of the companies that have made my life, you know, just t a better in, in very measurable ways. So Apple, for example, I use their mm -hmm. products every day and I love what they do. They rely on these middle-aged tactics, this, these mercantilist tactics of, mm -hmm. you know, using patents to prevent others from, you know, quote, stealing their ideas. And mm -hmm. 
I feel highly ambivalent about that. And I'm curious if you've experienced that ambivalence as well with some of the companies that have this Jetsons world type technology, but at the same time engage in pretty immoral actions. Yeah. Well, let me say, first of all, about, about this, the intellectual journey associated with IP, you know, uh, it took me like six years to come around to this view. When I first read Stefan Kinsella's monograph on the topic, um, I tell you, my attitude of it was dis- was 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 awful. I just thought, oh, for goodness sake, you know, <laughs> don't libertarians have anything better to do than write such absurd uh, things as this? This has nothing to do with the real world. And, uh, I mean, really, I, I just thought, uh, I don't know who the Stefan Catella is, but uh, uh, this is just not productive. I mean, that was truly my attitude. And... And yet, what's great about the topic is it really sort of forces you to revisit fundamentals. You know, you'd think the libertarians would know something about property. And I thought, I'd read every book on the topic. I thought I knew about property. And, and Stefan Kinsella's argument, you know, you know, deals with something so foundational. And, and it puzzled me because I couldn't really answer his argument, so I just kind of dismissed it. So it took me six years to finally come around to this point of view. So now, then having adopted the point of view, of course, you, you eventually arrive at, you know, a, a, exactly the kind of problems you mentioned. Some of the greatest Jetsons world style companies are totally dedicated to IP. But, you know, Mac is a, is a typical, uh, Apple is a typical situation. I mean, um, you see this again and again throughout all of history. In the early stages as a, as a small infant industry, as, a, as, a, as, an, as an innovator in a, in a field, the companies. Uh, steal ideas, of course you can't really steal ideas, but they, for lack of a better term, they steal ideas from whatever they can um, until they become big and big and big and then they become dominant and then they get annoyed uh, that other people are uh, are taking from them, you know, and learning from them and, and the, the competition, the competitive element seems to be like a distraction to them. So they th- that's when they freeze things in place. It's a typical mercantilist uh, solution, and we see it again and again. I mean, the only people who really benefit from IP are the the people who are already on top, and what they're trying to do is stop the market process, and that's essentially what 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 Apple has done. You can Google this up, but there is an interview with Steve Jobs that was done, I think, sometime in the mid to late '90s, in which he said, um, "I'm a shameless thief. I've stolen every idea I've ever had." And he says, I'm proud of it. Just like Picasso said, that's where real genius comes from. You know, he has an interview and he talks about this, that mm-hmm. everything that brilliant that, that, that Apple ever did is stole from somebody else. And, I mean, it, he really made sense. I mean, he, it was an honest and true uh, interview in which he's, he really spoke from his heart about the reality of, of free enterprise. And it was only much later on that he got on this, this cra- only in the last few years of his life, he got on this crazed, cra- you know, insane um, uh, IP uh, uh, dedication that he had where he would you know, threaten people, you know, in, with, with, with violence. You know, he would, he, there, there's other interviews very late when he was, I mean, using very, just outright wicked language, you know, to describe. Yeah, didn't he say he wanted to, like, destroy Google or something? And yeah. Just no, it was take just, them it down? Just, Oh, it's, yeah, just terrible stuff. I mean, really violent rhetoric. And, you know, I think it's a good example of how, you know, the very existence of IP itself represents a kind of moral hazard, even to the best innovators and the best entrepreneurs. Uh, that's a major reason to get rid of it, because it, it, does, it does kind of intellectually corrupt uh, the entrepreneurial sector. Uh, and I think it's just truly tragic. I mean, no, every, every industry, sh- industry should be like the fashion industry. You know, the, I mean, in, in the world of fashion, they come out, you know, they have these wonderful things called the runways, you know, and everything's super secret and super hidden until that great moment, you know, when the spring fashions are released. And they do it to a big whoop to do, and all the cameras are there, and uh, everybody's walking the runway and, and looking fabulous and wonderful. And why are the cameras flashing? Yeah, they want to run them in the fashion magazines, but the, the, also many of the people flashing cameras are the pirates, you know, so they get to work. But meanwhile, you know, the, 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 the innovators um, have already produced the stuff, and they've got them in the, the highbrow stores, and they sell them at very high prices. So, you know, a blouse that may cost $500 um, uh, upon release in February, you know, by, uh, by August is in Target for $25, you know? Um, 
I mean, it's an industry that thrives on, on piracy. And every, uh, every great creator in the fashion industry knows this. And for them, it's a wonderful challenge that they've overcome. And it's what keeps the industry dynamic and fascinating and, and uh, adds so much value to our lives. It makes fashion fun. It makes clothing fun. You know, I mean, the introduction of IP to the fashion industry would have totally wrecked the culture of the whole industry. So, I mean, every industry could operate like fashion. That's my point. I mean, we, we, we need to, uh, in a world without IP, we would find ways to make life more fun, more creative, more innovative. And that's way better than hectoring speeches from the likes of Steve Jobs about how everybody is evil, stealing their ideas. I was on an airplane the other day. And I'm using my Mac, right? I'm, I'm using my touchpad brilliantly and flying all over the screen. The person next to me has got some dumpy uh, Toshiba, you know, and, and the touchpad doesn't do anything. I mean, it's like, okay, you can bunk it, you know, here and bunk it there to make something happen. Well, you know, how easy would it be for a Toshiba executive to look next to the person, to the person who's next to in the airplane and say, hey, that's a cool little uh, touchpad. I wonder why we can't have that on our, mach our machine. Well, what prevents it? I mean, I don't know the specifics, but I'm, I'm guessing that there's a great deal of the touchpad that's on a MacBook that is thoroughly patented. Everybody's terrified to replicate it, you know? And that's, to me, tragic. I mean, that reduces human welfare. So I hope that answered your question. Absolutely. Thank you. Oh, David has just um, typed in a question. I'll, I'll read it out. Uh, Jeffrey, do you think that the role of technological innovations is understated in mainstream history books and that history gives too much room to politics? Oh, listen. Yeah, I mean, to hell with political history. Uh, I, I slogged through some huge treatise the other day by uh, this guy, guy, Fukuyama. What's his name? Something Francis like Fukuyama. And it's about, you know, it had a promising title. It was something like, I don't, I don't even know right now, the, the birth of, of something or other. And, yeah, from the first page to the last, he seems to, he seems to always approach everything. Like every civilization rises and falls according to the structure of government that it has. So, oh, this country had a parliamentary system, and this is what happened. This, this country had a democracy, and this is what happened. This country had a dictatorship. This one had an authoritarian regime that was shared among families, and this is what happened. I mean, this is a, all a gigantic mistake. I mean, <laughs> he, 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 he seems to think that the nature of the, the state itself is determinative of, of the course of civilization. He's looking in all the wrong places. Yeah, I find political history dreadfully, dreadfully dull. And it, to me, it's incredibly tragic when you look at the textbooks that, you know, high school students are, are, are looking at and they want to, they want to study, they want to study um, European history. And it's a series of essays about kings and princes and barons and who they married and the wars they fought. What a bunch of bullshit. I mean, that is not European history. I mean, European history is the history of an invention of, of a civilization. It was the, the history of a people rising them, lifting themselves up from, the, from being no better than the animals to being giants bestriding the earth. You know, that had nothing to do with kings and queens and barons and lords and all the rest of this nonsense. So, yeah, that's not history. I mean, the, the, real history is the history of what we call uh, private life. You know, it's the kind of technology we had access to. It's whether we can get cures, how they worked, uh, what we ate with, how we ate. I love, by the way, the history of manners. That is very interesting to me. Uh, well, every aspect of the history of private life. You know, what they did on Sunday, how long uh, weeks, how long they really worked during the week, what did the average peasant, where did he live, what kind of thing. Did the average peasant in the 13th century sleep on? How did he go about trying to improve his mattress? I mean, to, to me, that is glorious. How did the tomato arrive in Italy? You know, I mean, these are the great questions. And it all comes down to technology and commerce. Commerce is the heartbeat of civilization itself. And to the extent we're not studying commerce, we're not studying the stuff that makes life wonderful. So, yeah, I mean, I, I wish that every history book could be uh, completely writ rewritten. And actually, you know, oddly, it's the left that tends to do a lot of the best history. And it's because of this, because of this um, resentment that the, that, that the left has about sort of the great man 
you know, theory of history, you know, so we have to learn about Churchill and we have to learn about FDR and all this nonsense. The left doesn't buy that. And so they tend to write some of the, some of the best histories because they're, they're covering what common people did. And libertarians, I think, should have the same point of view. Well, that's what we're interested in. We're interested in what the common people uh, did and how they lived, how long they lived, how many, how many of their children survived. I mean, at what point in history did it come to be that any woman over the age of 30 didn't look back on her life with this tremendous sense of sadness that, that three of her five children are dead? That's an extraordinary thing when infant mortality fell. I mean, it led to an increase of human happiness for half the world's population uh, of, of un, uh, unbelievable levels. That's what capitalism gave us. That's what, the, that's what commerce gave us, a, a vast increase in, in human happiness itself. That's far more interesting than wars and royal marriages. Absolutely. I'm with you. Yes. The, the history of civil society, of what people outside the government were actually doing with their lives. Yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah. And it's hard to find books like that, actually. And when you find them, uh, you stay very closely engaged in the text. There's a, a book, uh, gosh, I, maybe somebody can Google this real quickly. His, uh, the, uh, the Rise of Plenty, I think is the, is the name of the, the, name of the, name of the book. And I read it was really just a few weeks ago. And um, wow, what, it, it's just so, it's so interesting. And you know what the great thing about reading history like that is you don't, you no longer take life for granted. You suddenly look around you and you realize, my God, this whole place was made by human hands and it was made for me. And in a state of nature, none of this would exist. And what then, what are the values we should embrace to give us more of this kind of world and less of the kind of world that leads to bloodshed and human suffering? And, and that's why I think... I think libertarian anarchism really comes from that realization of, of where beautiful things come from. I just looked it up, Jeffrey. Was it called The Birth of Plenty by William Bernstein? Yep, it's a great book. And his other book, too, um, On Trade, uh, is also a really wonderful book. Both those books, sort of popular uh, scholarship in a way. Yeah, wonderful books. Bernstein, right. Great guy. Awesome, yeah. awesome. Excellent. Good eye this guy has. Uh, uh, Murray Rothbard used to say about all really uh, great books, um, read everything but the last, the last chapter. That's where the author usually, usually ends up screwing it up. Uh, right, that's where they put their, their, um, their own um, prejudices in. And, and it's true with these two books, by the way, too. I mean, just forget the last chapter and everything else is great. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Did anyone else have any, uh, any, uh, uh, I've realized that we've uh, taken up nearly an hour of your time. So, uh, any, anybody have any, um, sort of final questions, um, for Jeffrey? I have a, just a quick question. One more quick question. Um, and it's less, you know, it's less on topic. And I'm just curious, cause you said a minute ago, I slogged through a treatise the other day and that struck me as an uncommon sentence. So I'm curious how many books you read per year. Oh wow! For your, I don't know about you, but you know, I, I, I uh, whew, yeah. So I'm reading um, absolutely constantly, and you know, we can all read more and faster than we think. I was very inspired by Murray Rothbard in this sense because I saw the first time I saw him just devour a book. You know, he 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 bought it at the bookstore, and I left him on a park bench, and uh, and then went to go pick somebody up or something. And I came to pick Murray back up again, and he had already read about two thirds of the book. You know, underlined li underlining it frantically. And I know this only because he got in the car and handed me the book and I picked it up and, and my mouth fell open at what I was seeing, you know, with these pen marks strewn throughout this book that he, he, he had just bought a few months ago. Uh, and I thought, wow, this guy has a nose uh, for, for what's important. He was able to get through this book very quickly and it inspired me to, to, to do that same thing. You know, it's a little bit like being a um, uh, playing, you know, tennis or some sport with a really great athlete inspires you to to do more than you you think you, than you thought you could do. So that's what it was like being around Murray Rothbard. So it inspired me to be a, a better and a faster reader. So I'm always reading, um, you know, I don't know, uh, half a dozen books at a, at a time. And you know, I have to tell you from a purely technological point of view, e-books have dramatically increased the pace at which I can I can plow through uh, books. Uh, uh, much faster than 
than physical books. The physical physical paper tends to slow me down. So part of what we're doing at Laissez Faire Books is really dedicated to uh, ebook distribution. I don't know if uh, you have had that experience, but but I've I've loved what ebooks have done for my reading speed. I like them very much. Yeah, I've I've certainly had that experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. And by the way, uh, let me just say one uh, final thing here about what to read, um, because um, uh, I think libertarians sometimes get a little bit tangled up in in this issue. Um, I believe that we should be reading, you know, anything that's worth your time. Uh, that doesn't mean you have to always read people who are 100 percent sound on every issue. Um, Murray used to read, you know, anything and everything. If you learn, if you're reading something that's that's absolutely unsound, then you can argue within your mind you're better off as a result. You know, if you're reading things that uh, comport comply entirely with your, your your point of view, that's that's you know perfectly fine too. But we should read books that challenge us, you know, and we shouldn't be afraid really to um, read things that are utterly contrary to what we think we believe because it, it's only going to strengthen our position and we're fearless intellectuals, which we should all be and get to the point where we're, we're utterly fearless, um, then we shouldn't be afraid of any writer, any genre, you know, any political point of view. It just makes us better thinkers. So I, I would very much encourage the broadest uh, possible re- reading. And there's the, the bell that went off in the hotel. I don't know why this hotel has bells, but... <laughs> it sort of underlines your point, you know? It's kind of adding weight. <laughs> Strange to me, yeah. But anyway, so I'm back inside. But um, anyway, yeah, I do want to encourage that and not to read sort of dogmatically, but to stay broad and have total confidence in, in, in this seemingly radical... Um, an unmainstream point of view, namely, you know, Austro-libertarianism or, or anarchism or whatever you want to call it, because I think it's a point of view that's robust enough to hold up under any attack. Absolutely. And, you know, if it comes the day that uh, we read something that finds a flaw in one of these ideas, then let the chips fall where they may, you know, then, then we will have learned that too. That's right. We don't, we don't possess a completed system of thought. Uh, otherwise, what's the point of thinking? You know, we would just drop our catechism and memorize it, you know, <laughs> and, die. and then we will have uh, li- lived complete lives. No, we don't believe that. Uh, there are ways in which everybody can contribute to the great intellectual project that is before us. Every one of us has something special to offer, and we should never be shy about that either. And fortunately, technology has permitted us the means to do so. So I'm expecting wonderful things to come about um, in the future. Ideas that had never occurred to us before. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, I would like to just ask you one last question, Jeffrey. Um, You know, do you have any um, upcoming projects? I know obviously you're very uh, much involved now with your your role at at Lassifan Books, but do you have any uh, new, um, new books coming out or anything that you can tell us to look out for? Well, I do have another uh, collection coming out, and this week I've started work already on what I hope will be a a book on the culture of the digital age, which I don't think has been written yet. So I'm I'm very excited about that project. Um, Laissez-faire I've been on since November and uh, working... Uh, uh, wildly, you know, to first of all clean up the inventory, develop a new website, um, to uh, start to start the marketing, uh, get authors lined up for books. I'm, I'm I'm looking at I'm working right now on 20 separate books for for publishing <clears throat> in the future, which is very exciting to me. And also, within the next 30 to 45 days, I'm rolling out a brand new um, project, and it's a big project. So, and I think I'll just let that be a surprise. Excellent, excellent. Well, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure to hear your your uh, your thoughts and you know wonderful sense of, of optimism and uh, and passion about uh, you know about the importance of, of ideas and and uh, and you know the amazing opportunity of uh, of, of learning and, and and contributing. So thanks so much, Jeffrey. Thank you for all you do, Jake, and thank all of you for being here today and for having me on this show. It's been lots of fun. <laughs>